So I'm going to be talking briefly about uh, what we did in the curation pilots. You've already kind of been set up nicely with that in Richard's talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about what we actually did, give you a real sense of, of the work that we did. Uh, we have some pretty significant findings that came out of that. We're just now exiting a two-year pilot program and hoping to move into production. Uh, recommendations that we're making to that oversight committee that Richard talked about and to the RCI program. Uh, and then how we plan on implementing this uh, as we move forward. So one of the very first things that we had to do, and Richard uh, again laid the groundwork for this, was actually to define curation. And this is something that is, everybody kind of has a slightly different definition of curation, and, and that's fine. I'm, I'm not really, you know, that's not the point here. But what is the point is we had to work hard to define this for people who had never heard the word, who didn't understand it, who didn't actually come from, say, a library and information professional background. Um, and so we had to really make a clear definition of it. And so we kind of cribbed and, and borrowed from a couple different sources. I think this is from uh, DCC, uh, one of the, the UK institutions, um, and put this in front of, and this is actually language that is used in our campus planning documents. So this is not even from within the library. This is from within campus. And 2008, 2009, that was pretty significant, a pretty significant step. And we especially highlighted this first sentence, and this was really to try to grab the researchers uh, and administrators that this is actually managing and promoting and, and using data from the very beginning, um, not from the end, not purely just in terms of publications and finished research. And I'm going to be circling back to that um, kind of uh, practical steps involved with that um, it, later on in the presentation. So the curation pilots, uh, just to set the, the scene a little bit, um, two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, we started this process by actually putting out a campus-wide solicitation and said, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to take about two years to do this. Um, here's what curation is. Here's the kind of things we're going to be doing. Um, who, and this went out to the research community on campus. Who'd like to participate? Um, and one very important caveat is they had to participate. This was not a service. This was actually, we want to learn from you. We want you to put some time into this process. Um, and so we, at, we had a little over two dozen responses to that. Uh, so it's kind of like a little mini solicitation um, process. Uh, each, each response was anywhere from three to ten pages in length with kind of budgets and staffing and all those kinds of things. And then we went through and winnowed it down to uh, five pilots in the end. And we saw these five pilots as being representative of uh, communities uh, that we work, re research communities on our campus that are core uh, and central to the campus mission. And so broadly speaking, we had about a half dozen curation pilot goals, what we wanted to end up with. And just to touch on these briefly, um, so investigate what it actually means to do this, to make research data discoverable and reusable, again going back to that definition. Um, very clearly, we had a mandate to work with existing tools that we had on our campus, uh, either that we had developed ourselves or we brought in or, or what have you, um, but not start from scratch, you're right? Not, not spin up a brand new program, but actually use some of these things that we had in place. Um, learn how the researchers, librarians, uh, the information technology people, how we all work together um, in what is kind of this new field or bringing these pieces in, into a new kind of connection. Uh, and then come out of the pilot program uh, recommending production services uh, and then developing budget and cost models. Um, so it really was a pilot. Obviously, anytime you do a pilot, there's a possibility that you end at the end of the pilot, but we're always on the assumption that we were driving towards something. So I'd like to talk a little bit now about the pilot participants. And so these are the content provider. These are the people who actually um, we have put into curation, we are bringing into curation and using in our system. So uh, the first one is working group on campus called the Brain Observatory. Um, this is uh, neurophysiology. Um, they study brains. <laughs> um, and they actually start from the physical specimens. They bring them into a lab. Uh, they actually um, slice the brains into slices, uh, sl put those all in slides. They preserve the physical slides, the physical medium. And then they go through and digitize all of the slides. And then they were like, well, what do we do with all these slides? What do we do with all these images? What, what next kind of things? Um, and so we actually targeted in the, cura in the curation effort um, one patient, HM, um, who is often known as the most famous patient in this field. Uh, they actually acquired his um, brain uh, when he passed away two years ago, three years ago, something like that. Uh, and so we're working with this kind of very bounded collection. And just some notes on kind of uh, statistics about um, 
about this collection, um, and I do this for all of them, um, just to indicate that they're all slightly different, they had kind of slightly different needs. So uh, the HM pro process and the Brain Observatory, they actually have already spent a, a ton of money to put together a really, really nice website. If you, go, if you Google them or if you go to the Brain Observatory, brainobservatory.org, excuse me, um, you'll see a really, really nice website. And they said, we, you don't need to recreate that, right? That's, that's, we've done that. Um, but what we do need is what is going to happen with all this stuff? What's the university's role in all of this? Who owns this? Who owns the content here? And so uh, really, how do we present that and how we put that into a curated system? Um, they had a number of, of requests in terms of how to, how to uh, show this data. Right? They had things like, well, we want to fly through it like a kind of a Google Maps kind of interface, or we want to be able to have people have these strong um, structures and, and all these kinds of things. And, and that's all cool, but what does that mean in the long term? How do you preserve those? How do you kind of um, make those available 5, 10, maybe 15 years to a different generation of scientists or to the general public? Um, and they also had, and this gets kind of more into the kind of the archival aspect of it, it's not just the data of the data set, but they had um, proposals, letters, interviews, um, both uh, audio and video interviews um, with HM himself as well as with doctors and everyone involved. How do we put those into a coherent, seamless whole so that you don't just have the data sitting there with kind of no semantic reference around it? Second group we worked with is completely different kind of science, uh, open topography, and this is um, a very kind of typical NSF uh, project where they fund uh, a research group to go and collect data from around the country that hundreds if not thousands of other people are generating and bring it into a central source and, and refine it and make it available. Uh, so they work with topography data, as in their title, um, and it's LIDAR, so it's planes flying over the earth, um, scanning, sending uh, radar down and, and building these really, really advanced maps based on it. And so, and this for us was a very typical kind of collection because basically um, they're getting in petabytes of data and it's coming in on thumb drives or it's coming in via emails or it's coming in in FedEx boxes and it's sitting under a grad student's desk and what do they do with it, how do they manage it. Um, you know, they would do all their science and get these really, really nice structured drive data but the big raw data is still sitting there. So what happens to that? Right, because that's just as valuable as the derived data um, in the long term. Um, and so we had to look through a lot of those kinds of discussion issues. Um, they are grant funded. In fact, when we started working with them, they were just finishing their first generation of grant funding. They actually successfully got their second generation in the last six months or so. But this is an issue we all face on campus. Well, what happens when that ends? Who manages their data? Where does it go? Uh, where, does, where does the portal go? Who manages access to all that data? Um, the other thing that they really pushed us on, and this became important for a lot of the research we did, uh, work we did with researchers, is DOIs, um, object identifiers. And so these are, they've generated this derived data, they want some way that people can put it, reference it in publications, reference it for um, maybe even for tenure, tenure review processes, things like that. And so if you think of the, the data is the publication, uh, how does it get pointed to? Um, and so one of the things that we're, uh, we worked hard um, in the UC in general and in UCSD specifically is we actually now provide DOIs through the Data Site Foundation free to all our researchers. Uh, and it's actually kind of cool, it's mediated through the library, so they actually have to come and talk to someone in the library to get an account uh, so we know who they are and, and have that kind of information. And then they're off, they can go off and do what they want, they can assign millions of DOIs to their objects, we don't, you know, we don't care, we don't take ownership of that. Um, but it's kind of cool we get to have that, that uh, negotiation with them. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hang on. Hopefully that's the only time it does that. Um. Uh, a third set of data we worked with was actually archaeology data. And uh, this is a pretty significant collection. Um, this group, the Levantine Archaeology Lab on campus, is known worldwide as being um, in the forefront of actually digital archaeology. So they go out into the field, in this case it's primarily Jordan, and they'll take a half dozen researchers and you know, basically a truckload of equipment. 
um, from scanning equipment to photography equipment to um, they've pioneered the use of these little kind of mini weather balloons that they rise up about 100 feet above and they take photographs and get stratigraphy and you know, all these depth charges. Um, and they came to us and they said, this is really cool. The problem is we have people out in the lab generating all this information. They come back and their metadata is not consistent with the metadata that we've used because the grad student talked about it differently. You know, or it comes back and it gets dumped into a database and now we're overriding records because someone was working on it at the same time. You know, how do we kind of negotiate this process to get data in and describe data? Um, and so we worked, uh, I've already kind of said some of these, uh, we worked quite a bit um, with them in this process. Uh, this is also was kind of interesting because this was one of the collections where they had significant, a mix of significantly digital and physical objects, right? So there was like, well, we've got this little pot here and we have a digital scan of it. Well, how do we reference this? How do we point to it? How do we talk about it? These kinds of things, very practical day-to-day -day kinds of things. Um, and then the other thing we saw, and this is, true of a number of disciplines, and archaeology is, is very strong in this sense, is depending on what country you sit in and what school you came from and what field you're work by field, I mean actually physical field, um, you're working in, your metadata standards are completely different. You know, they don't even use the same word blue. Um, and so uh, it's a very complex relationship in terms of how much metadata, metadata you actually need to create in order just to share this with someone who's in Britain or who's sitting, you know, sitting at Oxford as opposed to UCSD. It makes a big difference. Um, another collection we work with, and this is one of our, our uh, important groups on campus, is the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, they've been around for 60, 70 years. Uh, they actually, one of the reasons UCSD exists is because Scripps existed first, uh, and they put the campus there. Um, and so we were working with them, um, and they, out, they go out, their ships go out, and we're working with their core and dredge samples. So the ships go out, they drop a thing to the ocean floor and pull it up and get these massive uh, collections of, of stuff. And then they bring it back into the lab and study it and do an analysis and, and what have you. Um, and they needed a lot of help with, with kind of basic data organization. And this is not, that sounds a little negative, but it, it, it really wasn't. And it harkens back to the archaeology, whereas, um, you know, we're, we're looking at collections. The one collection we're looking at goes back to the early 60s. And depending on what decade it was collected in, um, the ship may have changed names. Um, Whoever was collecting the data may have changed names. Um, they they reference things differently, and so it was this big, huge cleanup effort of we've got all this stuff. How do we make it all consistent and usable, um, so that you know the grad student who's now who graduated 30 years ago, uh, how do we go back and reconstruct some of these things? Um, they also had they were similar to the archaeology. They have physical things and digital things, and they also have overlapping communities in terms of how things get referenced, who owns them, what kind of discovery interfaces are used, uh, and the like. Uh, the last group we worked with um, is uh, computational astrophysics. This is another big field that we have on campus, um, and these are people who are um, kind of the opposite of the Scripps people. These are people completely computational. Um, the, the group we work with, the data we're working, working with, is actually computer simulations looking at the Big Bang. So what is the, what does the universe look like since the Big Bang and forward? And these are the people who are capable of generating like a petabyte of data in about five minutes. And then they're like, oh, what do we do with it now? Um, and so uh, they do a lot of work. And they're actually really, really good people to work with because they're very savvy in a lot of the things that we deal with because they get metadata. They understand references. They understand um, how do I hand this off to people who don't have any idea what I'm talking about. And so they were really, really good people. They were the first people we worked with and really pushed us hard in terms of kind of defining requirements, defining communities, uh, and the like. Um, and so I, I'll actually be showing them uh, in depth in just a second. So I'm not going to talk about this too much. But if you need someone to work with, astrophysics people are great. Um, they, will, they will dive in first. So I mentioned we had, um, we used several different tools um, to do these things. And I wanted to highlight this because right now, actually literally right now, um, we're beginning to make these data sets available in our curation uh, enterprise. So I wanted to give you a flavor of what that looks like. Um, one of two of these are actually live websites that you can go to. Um, and one, the third one is in development and will be in production in the next four to six weeks. 
So we use two primarily, primary t big tools um, to make the, the display and discoverability pieces. Um, the first is the UC San Diego Library's digital asset management system, the DAMS, um, which is the tool that has been in place for about a decade now driving our digital library. Very standard stuff, you know, texts and images and videos and audios, kind of thing you would expect a library to be doing. Um, we're very lucky in the sense that uh, the tool that we used, uh, it's a homegrown tool, the DAMS is homegrown. Uh, they actually started out, they're really pioneering um, in using triple store, semantic web, link data, a lot of things which are kind of cool, important buzzwords now. They started doing six and seven years ago. And that made it really interesting. Right now they're putting out the new next generation of their tool and, and we, they let us guide a lot of that discussion based on research data. And we'll see what that looks like in just a moment. Uh, another thing we mentioned, the question was asked a minute ago about CDL UC3. Um, we are actually putting data, the same data, also in one of their repositories, uh, so sitting up in Oakland, uh, in California, um, the Online Archive of California. And this is an, on well, it's an Online Archive of California. <laughs> um, it's, sorry, I said that. Um, it's a digital system that's again, has been in place for a number of years. Uh, it is, again, not geared towards research data per se, but to traditional digital objects. And so they're also very excited to, to get these collections in. And um, I'm going to talk about them. So first, just, just some quick pictures. Um, so as I said, and this, the DAMS is the system that is going to be in place in the next four to six weeks. Otherwise, I would point you the URL to you. Um, and so what we're doing is um, bringing data into that collection, making it discoverable, searchable, um, displayable, all those kinds of things. Um, and this is um, the opening page uh, of that. And you will be getting our slides, uh, the presentations later, so you will have a chance to see the tiny little print that you can't see here. Um, and so these are the first two collections we have in our collection page. Uh, you see representative Im images here of the Scripps Institute, a rock pulled up from the bottom of the ocean. And the pretty picture is actually that you cannot see at all, uh, is a, a representation of astrophysics data. Um, this is represent representation of the universe probably eight billion years ago or whatever it was. Um, as we add the other collections in, they will all be listed here. Uh, and two things I wanted to highlight. One is, even within just uh, the research data, we're really working on cross-collection discoverability and searching. So that it's, they're not siloed, they're not separately, they're all, all, all usable together. Um, and even more broadly, uh, the system we're looking at here is not a boutique separate system from the library's general system. It's all in one place. So in six months, if someone comes into the library's catalog and, or the, the digital catalog and types in rocks, they'll get the research data, they'll get the books and materials that the library has, they'll get Scripps Institute materials, one place to allow researchers to, to go and find things. Uh, so drilling this down into this, this is an example of a specific object in the dams. Uh, again, this is another uh, astrophysics simulation um, representation. And what you absolutely cannot see is um, on the left are all of the complex components about this object, including um, multiple images, all of the Excel files underlying it, um, uh, the official papers and proposals that were, generate, that were used to generate this data. You can all get that from here, as well as links to all of the researchers and control vocabularies based on it, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and all of the complete metadata records. Uh, I mentioned the Online Ar Archive of California. This is something you can go to. If you just do a web search on that, you will get this site and you can actually search on it. Uh, and so if you went into this box and searched on um, astrophysics or cosmology or any of the kind of uh, words that were used, you would pull it up and you would pull up. This is the exact same data, the exact same data set represented in this other tool. And that was really important for us because what it means is two things. One is that um, we were able to work with the researcher and using our internal processes once spit out the, the data and the metadata and the references and then hand that off to mul multiple sources. And then they could put it into their interfaces and we didn't have to do it twice. And so depending on how people got to it, what they're searching for, they're going to get uh, the information they're looking for um, from whatever channel they come from. Uh, as I said, yes. <laughs> uh, I mentioned open topography. Um, I just wanted to highlight briefly this, again, I think is pretty, uh, a pretty strong example of the kind of thing we're going to see over and over again. They again said they have their portal. This is what they do. They don't want us to recreate it. 
Uh, this is an example of derived data in their world. I wanted to highlight, though, that sitting behind it are three important things. As I said, one, there's a DOI listed there, so they can hand that off and people can get this data immediately. Um, they came through us for that. Uh, the second one is a data download. Um, we are actually sitting and holding uh, terabytes of their raw data so that if someone comes in and is authenticated through their system, they can get the data. And that it's actually coming from a library server sitting at SDSC in a cloud server, so it's this weird uh, conglomeration. Um, but then we hand it off to them. And then the third thing is, and we push them hard for this, is the box, the text box there about semantic completeness is initially they said, just, just keep our raw data. Just, just we need somewhere to, to put it. And we said, well, we can do that, but it would, wouldn't it really be cooler if we could get the basic metadata so that let's just say your grant runs out and you go away um, and you needed to hand this off. You don't just have 50 tarballs sitting there that nobody knows what they are. We actually can hand those tarballs off with, um, with metadata files so that people can look at them and say, oh, this is what this is and this is what the file types are and this is the, the equipment that generated it and et cetera, et cetera. So we've got that and we can now hand that off to people. So we're about 16 months into this two-year pilot, uh, probably 17, I guess we're in April now, which is kind of scary. Um, and just to highlight again, uh, we redesigned and re-implemented existing technologies as much as possible. Uh, we did a lot of work. Most of the work is not technology, Mark. Most of the work is the metadata, is the staffing, is the helping people organize their data and manage it. Um, and then, as I said, we put it in multiple, multiple ways to make it discoverable. So I want to highlight what we learned and what we want to recommend based on this. So one big overarching statement, and I've already kind of uh, prefaced this a little bit. Um, one is, and Richard talked about this in his talk, um, one is the data life cycle needs to be looked at holistically, not as, not as discrete elements. I'm going to break this down on the next slide, but this, we kind of knew this going in, but now we can actually say it for sure and back it up with empirical data. Um, and curation especially is not solely, I would say almost not driven, a technology driven enterprise. Um, you know, there's judgment needed, there's judgment about what data are important, about how to do the metadata. Um, and we ran into a lot of social aspects. And we, we went back and forth about how to say this last bullet, but uh, sharing data outside of your own lab or your own narrow field is really, really, really difficult. And um, what that means and how you kind of implement that um, is not easy. Uh, just a note briefly, um, there's a million different diagrams of the data life cycle. There's circles, there's squares, there's like whatever. Um, this is one that we happen to use um, just because it seemed, our users seem to grasp it pretty well. Um, and just that we talk about when we talk to them about working with data and working with the life cycle. And I'll be coming back to that in just a second. So specific finding one, um, our researchers really see the life cycle, they really do see it as a single workflow. Um, and we have, uh, whatever, eight or ten questions here, and we got asked specifically, and we still get asked specifically, every single one of these questions by almost every single researcher, you know. I'm not going to read these, but they probably look, where do I put my data? How do I get it there? How do I get it back? Who's managing it? How do I analyze it? How do I share it? How do I display it, reference it? All these kinds of things. And, and the last one is key. Who's going to keep it once I go away or once this grant goes away? Um, and so uh, the last bullet is really a recommendation and, and an implementation step is, okay, so we've heard that. Well, how do we now meet these needs? How do we do this, right? And, and Richard said this again. It's not so much that we say, oh, go talk to the storage guys for this one and come talk to curation for this and come talk to this other person for computation. That's a non-starter. People with about five minutes, they're like, that's too complicated. I'm, I'm going to go do it myself. It's finding two is expensive to do curation after the fact. And we kind of knew this going in as a pilot that we were, by definition, going in after the fact. Um, but, you know, to be explicit about it, all of the work we did was on data that they had already generated, they'd already created. Um, and that they really, really needed help organizing sometimes decades after it had been collected and created. Um, and that was a lot of work um, for the researchers. And it, it was kind of interesting, though. We had very, very little resistance people saying, well, this is a lot of work and I don't, it's not important. They actually recognized the importance. And uh, not, not tooting our own horn too much, but really almost every single person we talked to said, I really wish we'd talked to you sooner because I can't find my stuff, right? I, I, we can't, 
<laughs> um, we've got 12 different Excel files with 82 different column headers, and they're, they're not the same. And just some basic data management principles would have been very helpful early in the game for them. Uh, and again, I told you I'd come back to this. Um, just to be explicit, where we are coming in, where we came in in the pilots right now is the last two buckets there, data analysis and publication in many, many ways. Um, and where we really need to be coming in is in, on this side of the graph in from the very beginning of writing the proposal, but is also just, and it may be very, very, very lightweight, right? Think about some of the tools in terms of how to organize data. Think about some of the tools and how to reference data doesn't have to be a huge time commitment at the beginning, and that'll save it from being a huge time commitment at the end. Uh, finding number three, uh, there is absolutely in no way, shape, or form a standard definition of a data set. Astrophysics people talk very differently than brain people talk very different from oceanographers. Um, and that's not a problem, it's you need to recognize it. Um, that even at the unit of what it, an object is differs from, from time to time. Um, for some people, an object might be 5,000 files, and for other people, an object might be one file. And, and how you reference that and how you use it um, is, is really important. Uh, finding number three, just kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a positive statement that we do, and, and I think this is actually the case in many campuses and many institutions, um, depending on, on your goals, but we do have technologies and processes that we can bring, uh, bring to bear here. Uh, someone asked the question earlier about librarians being part of the process. I think we, a lot of the work that the librarians have done in, and I'm a librarian, so, that we did in this process um, was not all that different from what we've done all for our whole careers. Uh, it's working with different communities sometimes and different goals, um, but we can do this. We, can, we don't have to start from scratch. Um, finding five, uh, and we really heard this loud and clear, researchers definitely would like tools and or and best practices uh, for working with data and helping them manage their data. Um, a couple months ago, I, um, a, a quote I, I almost wanted to put on here actually from, came from artists, I mentioned artists at the beginning, um, and she said, you know, we had talked a lot, we've done a lot of training in the data management tool and data management planning and how to put these things into grants. And, she said, you know, people on campus are really getting that. We're kind of seeing that's, that's, they understand they have to do it. What we really need to help them with is data management, right? They know how to write a plan now. Then they need to actually know how to go and manage their data. Um, and the researchers realize this. Re researchers are really starting to get that. Um, and then the last uh, finding, and this is kind of a really a broad statement, um, but there's a lack of clarity about uh, kind of some of the whys you know, we've shown some of the what's and how's, but some of the why's are still open ended question. Um, in, you know, which data are appropriate for long-term stewardship? Um, when we started working with the astrophysics um, researcher, he had, I forget what it was, 15 to 20 terabytes of data, and he said, well, this is all key. We need to keep all of this. And then we sat down and he realized about half of it is log files. And he said, well, okay, that's probably not important. Um, and there may be even a smaller subset that is key for the next five to 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, there are important decisions that need to be made about that. Uh, and the university needs to step in and say some of these things too in terms of what is our intellectual capital? What is our intellectual product? And how are we gonna support researchers to, to keep these and to make them for the long term? So those were our findings. We do have some recommendations. And um, these are actually recommendations that we made uh, last week, <laughs> not coincidentally, um, uh, uh, to the uh, RCI Oversight Committee, uh, which Richard mentioned. And so these are things that we went back to them and said, OK, look at Here's what we think we need to in order to do our jobs. Uh, we start with two kind of big broad ones and then one specific one for curation. So. The first broad one, and this is an operationally broad one, is um, actively engaging in this discussion of data lifecycle services. Um, this, be, this is a bit of a buzzword and, and trendy and all these kinds of things, but it is actually significant and meaningful in the sense that as long as we're looking at these discrete services, uh, that's not really how our users are, are really using them. And so uh, normally I talk a lot about this. I think Richard actually talked quite a bit about it, so I won't go into it. But just in the sense of we need to get better at how we're bringing these things to our users. Uh, the second one, and this, this actually generated a kind of an interesting philosophical discussion on the Oversight Committee, um, as it should have, should have done, so I'm glad it did. 
Um, but we're rec recommending the formation of, and this is a name, I don't care what it's called, uh, some kind of advisory council board uh, ex officio, something that's sitting out there uh, helping to make decisions about why we're doing all this, right? Um, what, you, what data should the university be, the university be caring about? Because the university is the one's paying here, right? So what is it that they should be funding and why? Um, who should be paying at each stage of the data life cycle? You know, grants are really, really good at creating data and doing a little bit of storage, but then they're really, really bad at everything after that. And I'm here to tell you, everything after that is the expensive part. And so what do we do about that? Um, and then the whole other thing, which we haven't even started to talk about, but all of our researchers had questions about, is the intellectual property rights, right? I've generated my data on this sequencer. I'm now putting it into a library discovery system. You're shipping it off to Oakland to be discovered. Um, the university, but I want it to live for the long term, so the university should pay for that, but NSF, but NIH, and so, you know, how do all, who owns the data, who, who gets to make products of the data, um, all those kinds of things really need to be resolved. And we don't want to be the ones owning that decision. Um, that needs to be above us uh, in many ways. So those are our two broad recommendations. Um, Coming out of this, we do, and this is leading into what we see curation as a production service uh, coming starting next fiscal year, the next few months. Um, we've, I've talked about the pilots kind of as, as kind of big overall enchilada kind of th services, um, but we've kind of divided them up and we see um, four recommendations or four levels of service coming out of these, and I wanted to highlight these very briefly. Um, first off is offering a set of consultation services. And, Maybe consultation isn't the perfect word here, but really this is just the notion of uh, researchers often will come and say they need discrete help or they need kind of timely short-term help um, on a targeted project, right? So I'm, we're about to go out, we, we, just as an example, my team is about to go back out into the field. I'm sending two grad students out. How can I help them? What should I tell them in terms of tools to use to organize the data? Do you have resources you can point me to in terms of best practices for metadata? That could be a couple hours worth of work, right? That doesn't need to be necessarily a long-term relationship. It might be at least two, but initially it doesn't have to be. Um, working through grant supports, this is getting appropriate language into documents um, and the like. Uh, tool evaluation and helping people understand that they don't have to create it every single time for themselves, that both on campus in our system and nationally there are things out here that people have already created. Uh, I already mentioned DOIs. We see this actually as growing exponentially uh, very quickly. Um, we've had significant uptake just in the last few months of this. Um, the, last, uh, the next to last one I should say, uh, this notion of matchmaking with the data repository. Um, what we're seeing quite often is people coming and saying, I've got this data. I've got a terabyte of data of type X. I, where, where should I put it? Should I put it in a discovery system? Does it need to be in storage? Should it go in a, a, a CDL merit kind of repository? Or should it be going into something like Dryad, you know, a national repository? Or is there, is there an NIH-based repository it should go in? And they need help just kind of navigating that water, not necessarily implementing it, but just pointing to what some of the options are. Um, and then also discussions about um, proper storage um, recommendations for the long term, whether it's short term or long term, uh, for their data. And these are just examples. It's nothing set in stone, but a start. Uh, a second thing we've heard discreetly is this notion of preservation. Um, so basically, and uh, as was introduced, I, I actually manage Chronopolis, which is a preservation network. I'm not mentioning this as a plug. I'm just mentioning it because it's there. Um, but it's the kind of thing people can say, I have X amount of dollars and I need something to go for Y number of years. Well, okay, we can do that. If that's just what you need, if that's the kind of thing you need, we have that service, it's in production, it's not a problem. Um, so we don't need to bang you over the head for all these other things if you just need that. So that's fine. Um, the third thing is something we're right now calling the data management service. I'm not in love with that name, but um, we're, it's in development. Um, and this is essentially what we did with the pilots. So this really is a long-term, deep-dive relationship with a researcher, a research lab, what have you, who come and say, I have this data. I need help organizing it. I need somewhere to put it. I need help managing it. I need someone to help me put a discoverability layer on top of it, whether that's a portal or what have you, um, help. And this, in fact, may be something that ends up um, 
getting written into a grant or getting, getting written into some kind of long-term relationship, as I said, uh, working with researchers. And, and what we've heard from our pilots as an example is, um, and I use the, the brain guys as one example. Um, so we're working with one brain, but they're like, they'd like to actually build a brain library, right? So at the end of five or 10 years, and especially with the new announcement yesterday about brain research, we'll have to see where this goes. Um, maybe, they want a lot, well, maybe they want a library with 50 or 100 specimens in them. Well, that would be an example of, a, obviously, a very long-term relationship that you really want to be working um, hand in glove with them. Uh, the last uh, recommendation is the, con the uh, group of things in research and development. Uh, and this is really the, the give and take, the learn from each other kind of processes. Um, we've already referenced the, the DMP tool. Um, we're we're um, early adopters of that and want to continue working with that and working with how we can localize it and customize it in our environment. Um, one thing I have not touched on a lot, just uh, in the interest of time, but the notion of data papers. Um, this is something in certain fields that is, is the hot topic. It's basically how do you take data and put it in a published format that's not paper, right? That is actually online and people can drill back down to the data sets or the derived data and download it, verify it, do whatever they want. Um, the systems we've put in place both in the dams and the online archive are actually, especially the online archive, examples of a data paper where you actually can go there and get, if you were to print it out, um, it would look like a paper and it would function like a paper, but it's all online and, and live and access, accessible and, and can be changed if needed. Um, I've already mentioned we've heard a lot about needs for data input tools. Uh, we have a lot of researchers out in the field. How do they, how do they at least get lightweight tools set up for this? Uh, and then the last two things we see as very important is um, driving a lot of the policy issues around data. Um, as librarians, I think we're, we're very good in, as a field of learning as a field. Um, and we learn from our, our colleagues out there. And so we, we want to be able to bring this back and work with the researchers. Um, and then engage with the national, international data communities. So that's, that's where we see ourselves going. Just, just very briefly, um, implementation steps. As I said, we're coming out of the pilot phase June of this year and, and hope to move into uh, permanent uh, curation status. And so we've done one thing that is, has already happened in preparation of that, it, for that is the UCSD library has actually spun up a, data curation, a research data curation program within the library um, that we're staffing up right now, um, which Artis was the head of. <laughs> um, and so we're in the midst of hiring that position. Um, and so we've actually got some plans on the ground to make some of these things happen, regardless of specifically where RCI may go. Um, that's not to say that we don't see ourselves as completely integrated 100% with RCI, but there are organizational implications within the library for supporting some of these things. Um, and then as Richard already indicated, there's a lot of overlap in terms of implementation, especially storage and curation and some co-location, some of these things that need to get worked out. So, uh, you know, like I said, uh, we're hoping to be in play starting kind of July this time frame. Um, we've got people knocking on our door saying, you know, when, are, when can I start doing these things? Um, and so we're hoping to get going pretty soon here. So uh, that's it for me, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. In the back there. Uh, yeah, those are actually two excellent questions. Um, so uh, in terms of kind of specific schemas, whether it's recommended schemas or creating schemas, um, honestly, it depends. <laughs> um, what we found, not surprisingly, is that r existing schemas and existing kind of agreement, even if not schemas, but general agreement, varies widely discipline to discipline. Um, you know, oceanography, as an example, has um, extensive, an extensive history of, of kind of schema creation, metadata creation, um, for which there's actually some competition about how to, how to implement some of these things. Um, and so it, it really kind of depended. Um, I will say operationally, what we're going to be driving towards, at least for um, our services, is trying to create some, I don't want to say in-house, but some local recommendations so that the next time we get an astrophysics researcher, the next time we get a completely different brain researcher, we're not starting from scratch. 
And even if there's not kind of a national or international or some kind of agreement there, we at least we can say, here's what we've learned, and here's 15 things you might want to think about, those kind of processes. Um, and your second question was? Ah, uh, yeah, core minimal set. Uh, yeah, that's actually really interesting. And one, it's uh, uh, Richard's smiling over here because uh, he and I have had this discussion. Um, as we actually start to roll out not just curation but also storage, one, one thing I'm really pushing for is anybody who puts anything in storage is required to do a very, very minimal lightweight set of what we call metadata, what they may call kind of informational requirements, you know who you are, what's your discipline, what's a general description of the content here, uh, maybe who the funding source is. So at least, and then we have some, we all put that somewhere centrally, and so that we have somewhere to tap into it. And then as they kind of bubble up the service layer and asking for more, more and more sophisticated services, we can kind of layer additional metadata based on top of that. Um, so that's broadly speaking within RCI. Um, now, a slightly more complicated answer um, is as we start to put things into the discoverability tools, like let's say the dams, um, the data model for objects coming into the dams is like 20 pages. I mean, it's significant in terms of not just um, discipline-based discipline, discipline metadata, that's hard to say at the end of a talk, um, but also things like METs and MODs and FITs and all kind of library lingo that nobody else in the world has ever heard of, um, but that all of our catalogs are expecting, right? All of our systems are expecting. And so how do we bring, bring these things in-house without making the researcher care about that? Um, that's something we're really working hard at right now because um, we can't be throwing that at the researchers because they, they walk away very quickly from that. From? So I love the astrophysics plug because I'm from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics Library. Um, cool. But we, so I, you had a comment about an advisory council um, and the virtual observatory in astronomy mm -hmm. is like a good example of a council that has essentially, you know, in the end they've, they've, they've uh, been criticized for not doing anything. Uh, they talk about standards, they talk about protocols nothing really occurs in the end. Uh, and so they've, they've, they've had this reshuffle you know, recently. And, and one of our, our, our project, Astronomy Dataverse, is like doing that. You know, one of the people that's part of that, that group, the Virtual Observatory, mm -hmm. got frustrated and started doing, you know, doing something with our group. And so I wonder, you know, with your advisory council idea you know, in an institution, I wonder if that harms, you know, actually harms the doing part of things if it gets locked up into, you know, this fine. Yeah, so, yeah, two, com two comments on that, and this is where the camera's rolling. I'll be as politic as I can, but um, one is your, your, your example of, or your discussion of kind of the local researcher kind of getting frustrated with lack of progress or whatever and kind of saying, well, I'm, I, we need to do this, I'm going to do it ourselves. In many ways, that's exactly the discussion we had with our astrophysics researcher. He said, we have to do this, right? I need some way to share my data with people in Switzerland. And we need some, not just, I don't mean just physically sharing it, but some way of referencing it and talking about and building schemas under it. And he said, let's, let's start doing it because we can't wait for them, right? We can't wait for this international or national standard to come on board. So we definitely had that, if I'm understanding how you characterize it, that sounds very similar to the, the discussion we had. Um, and then to your second point about the possible risks of, of, of getting what you asked for in terms of, uh, I, guess I guess I'm done here. <laughs> um, um, yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually something, and, and Richard and I were talking about this last night. Um, we see that as a necessary function, and it needs to happen how it happens and how well it's going to happen and who needs to be in place to actually make that happen is, is kind of an open question right now. I mean, it crosses, especially in a largest university, it crosses, you know, dozens of departments and administrative levels and vice chancellors of this and associate chancellors of that and everybody's got, to, yeah, it's really hard to say.
talk a little bit about getting researchers to uh, come to some sort of understanding about data management? You mentioned that. Did you have training workshops? But what did you do with those Excel files? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Right now we're in the midst of um, really converting um, the classes that we've been teaching. The first year, year and a half, they really were um, geared to do two things. One is to get to intro data management plans, right? Because they started right after the NSF hit two, two years ago. Yeah, a little over two years ago. And they were in, that in conjunction with teaching people the data management uh, tool, the toolkit. Um, so it was really, here's, here's, here's what you need to do, and here's a nice, easy way that you can do it kind of thing. And what we found was our attendance, two things happened. One is our attendance went from like 50 people in a class to like three in about eight months, um, mainly because people said, oh, okay, I write grants for a living. Okay, just tell me what to do. I got it, right? They didn't necessarily need a class for that. And the population attending went from faculties and PIs to grad students because they're the ones actually, the faculty are saying, go, go do this, I can't be bothered to do it. Um, and so we're right now really reconfiguring uh, uh, the classes to be more about, here's man data management recommendations, right? Here are, and it really is probably gonna be geared more towards the grad student level, which is, here's some really basic, easy things you can do so that, uh, as Richard said, in five years when you're not here anymore, the next person can find what you did. Exactly, exactly, right, right. And, and in, terms of, um, in, in terms of kind of um, statistics or what we gathered from the classes, uh, it's still kind of early days right now. Uh, you know, the problem with anything especially that's related to grants or solicitations or proposals is it doesn't matter what you did now, it, it's going to be at least six months, it may be a year, it may be 18 months before you know, was it successful? Right? Were things funded? What, what, did, what did the NSF reviewers actually say about these proposals? You know, still, still don't really know that just yet. So. Were, were they, was it a, like a single one-day workshop or one afternoon workshop or a series of? Uh, they actually were one hour. The ones we did were one hour, um, pretty lightweight, um, kind of drop-in kind of classes. Um, we may consider doing a range of things. I know a lot of other uh, campuses, uh, universities, um, around the country have approached this different ways. So, yeah. Jake? David, you mentioned um, part of your goal in doing this project was to get a sense of the, the business model and cost behind it and how to address those costs. You Great, Jake, thanks. You talked about that in places, but I wonder yeah. if you could talk a bit more about that. No. How you see Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, no, actually, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, actually, and that's, um, to be honest, that's exactly what I'm probably going to be spending the next two months doing is looking at, because we do have pretty, we have very good statistics on um, what it took for us to do this in terms of FTE, infrastructure, the time we spent, both, both the time on the, on the part of the curation team as well as the time uh, on the researcher side of things. And so, A, we definitely have recommendations on, boy, we spent a lot of time doing that and then the payoff was like not very great or we didn't really end up how we wanted to. So we, we definitely have statistics and findings about that. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the recommendations which were just made last week to kind of get approval to keep going forward, um, we didn't hear no, so I'm assuming yes. Um, and so now we're going to sit down and say, okay, how do we want to roll out a consultation service, right? Do we do it, you get so many hours for free and then we start charging? Or do you get this kind of storage for free, but if you need something on top of it, you need to pay? Um, that's actually exactly the kind of discussions um, all of RCI is going to really be tackling in the next two months. Richard's got his hand up here. We, we have yet to develop this model, and, and David's right, he's going to be doing it. But my inclination is trying to do the, little, the first part free. And, and part of the reason is because I really want to try to incentivize adoption. We can't support the whole thing, but you know, the first week of help, some, some number like that, first so many gigabytes or terabytes, you know, and because there's this whole issue of what's the university's role in trying to do this, and especially as a new, relatively unfamiliar service, it's one thing to say a researcher needs computing, but I, I think some level free and then 100% cost recovery past that is the model I'm inclined towards. 
probably going to be the last question, but um, as part of your consultation service, I wondered if you had thought about the library funding a librarian to be part of a particular research team from the beginning of the grant through the cycle. Yeah, so absolutely. The National Library of Medicine is funding some experiments right now called the Informationist Program, mm -hmm. where some of us are participating in this kind of model. And I wondered in a non-health sciences library developing a consultation service if you're thinking beyond the traditional kind of reference service where you actually embed a librarian into the team. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and uh, I know if people have heard the questions, but it was basically about uh, the, the, if we've considered kind of, a, especially kind of a long-term and in-depth in embedding librarians into some of these processes, um, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, and, and yes, <laughs> very explicitly. In fact, we've, we've got that, we've got two things in mind. Um, first off, uh, first pass, what we definitely are already have in place, this gets into the question that was asked of Richard earlier, the concept of library liaisons, which is really building on our sub subject expertise that we already have in-house, our chemistry librarians and biology and data sciences, social sciences, and things like that, um, bringing them into the curation role so that they are actually using what they're already doing and have the connections they already have and bringing them into this kind of, this slightly different um, refactoring of what they're doing. Um, so that, that we're doing right now and we intend to do um, full bore starting in just a couple months. Um, and then the second thing is we definitely would like and hope to be able to start to broaden and deepen those relationships, whether it's um, a an embedded librarian or an embedded metadata expert or an embedded pick your role um, within some of these projects. Um, so yeah. Uh, it's a little early day to see how much uptake we'll be able to get to that, but I know um, Brian Schottlander, the university librarian, he's, that's, that's where he sees the future being for us. So, very sure. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.